$2.18 better off. Here's how non-annual compounding, in effect, works at the bank. First, I take some money out of my pocket and put it in the bank. Then the bank puts some more money into my account at the end of the third month. There's a little asterisk meaning this, is a com this was obtained by multiplying this times the interest rate for three months. It was called 6%, but that's nominal to get the real interest rate for a compounding period, you divide 6% by how many times during that year we're going to put money in. Then you put some more money at the end of 6, you put some more money in at the end of 9, you put some more money at the end of 12, and then I take the money back out of the bank. Uh, and it's a little more since you have put these investments into my account and admitted that they are mine and paid me interest on them. Um, we could also have done the same thing, or we will do the same thing. We would call it like an effective rate. The effective rate is listed in the uh, manual. The effective rate is 1 plus just the plain old rate. might be better called the nominal, the nominal rate divided by how many payment periods are going to be involved raised to the M payment periods minus 1. So in our case, the effective rate, because he was willing to compound quarterly, is 1 plus the nominal rate was 6% over 4 payment periods raised to the 4 payment periods minus 1 he gave me 6.136% interest as opposed to 6%. Really. Thus, my account is worth, and you use the same equation as before, 6,000 times 1 plus I effective, uh, 63, 68, 18, same number we found previously. Now, if you did that same thing for seven years, then the account is worth here again, you use the effective rate and uh, work it out. Uh, incidentally, you could also uh, use the tables for this. That would be $9,103. So let's take it back now. You can't use the tables for this because they don't have a rate for 6.136. So this one, you're going to have to use the equation uh, for I effective. Now. The other bank says, well, fooey, if his, if his bank's going to do that, tell you what I'll do, I'll give you money back in every two months. In other words, every two months, I'll admit you have money in my bank that earned a little interest, and I'll put that interest in your account rather than just keeping it in my pocket for you later on. Then you would find the effective rate by saying it's 1 plus the nominal rate divided by N nominal rate divided by M raised to the M payment period minus 1. In this case, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 payment periods, and we raise that to the 6th power. Instead of giving me 6.136, he's giving me a little more, 6.152. So the future value of my money in that case would be, there's the 6.152 would be $6,300. Now then, what if he'll do it every two weeks? In other words, there's a month, there's a month, there's a month, there's 12 of them. Every two weeks he gives me my interest. It was mine in the first place. Give it to me now and pay me interest on it from now on. Then the future value is 6,000 times 1 plus. Here's your nominal rate. There are 26 payment periods raised to the 26th power. I guess that's right, 52 weeks in a year, approximately, minus 1. You make $6,370 instead of uh, $6,368, so you make a little more. And what if I am willing to compound your interest continuously? I mean, every nanosecond that the time progresses, I'll see how much interest you got. I'll put it back in your account and pay you interest on that from then on. 
Then the effective interest rate is given. This is listed in the book, can be proved. You want to see that proof? Uh-huh, okay. The effective interest rate is E to the rate, that would be the 6% number, minus 1. And therefore, the effective rate in our case is 2.718 raised to the nominal interest rate, 0 0.06 minus 1, and the interest rate then is 6.18365, a tiny bit higher than, uh, I didn't write this one down, but you don't get much, but you get a little more. Well, look here. Here you got 6,370 compounding it uh, every two weeks. Here you get another buck. And you don't get another buck, you get another 40 cents. But regardless of the question asked, then you can solve for uh, any of those non-annual compounding questions. Now, sometimes you have some strange looking cash flows. For instance, if you invest $600 today, oh, that's bad, watch that. Invest $600 today, and 600 at the end of year one, and two, and three, and four, for, that's for five years, and then you start depositing $200 for the, at the end of the next four years, how much money can you take out of the bank? Now, one way you can do this is you just bring this forward to here, bring that forward to there, bring that forward to there, bring that forward to there, you can do that. And if there's not too many years involved, you might just want to do that. You just multiply this times I plus 1 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, to the 8th power, and write down how much money this a, the first day 1 is worth. Then go the next day 1, take his value, and multiply it times I plus uh, 1 plus I raised to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to the 7th power, because you're going to carry it forward 7 years. You just add them up. That would be one way to do that. But probably a better way is, first, don't be tricked. Telling you you're going to invest some money today in an annuity is not going to get the job done. Um, so we will move time back to the standard form wherein at the end of the first year we put in our first annuity. Uh, bet you I have a... No, that's okay. I was thinking I had a mistake here because I'm going to move time back. I was thinking this little arrow shouldn't be there. I didn't move the cash string. I just moved time back under it one year. All right. So now then this annuity is in standard form. Uh, unfortunately, annuity values are found at the end of the payment, and the end of this set of payments occurs right here. So now that I have taken this in standard form, I've done that much, I then transform this annuity into its future value at the end of the fifth year. And then I will actually have to take this F1, oh, and I show it here, and change it into its F2 value. So what I do is I take the annuity and find its future value. The future value of an annuity is always listed at the last year of the annuity payment. But that's three years shy, one, two, three, that's four years shy of when I'm going to leave the money in the bank. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll add this plus this, and that annuity is okay. I'll have to switch time around on it in order to get the time to go to the right place. In other words, you and I have been using this as the zeroth year. I have to scratch all those out and then say the annuity started here, so this is year zero, and it goes for one, two, three, four years as opposed to going nine years and stuff like that. They have to be in standard form. So F1, which is this guy right here, F1 is an annuity times F over A. It's $600. You'll notice the years is five years. So I look in the appropriate spot in the tables, and I get that that F1 is worth 33.82 at the end of the fifth year. Then I take the 33.82 and I move it forward another four years. I do that by it. It would be considered a uh, future value. 
Uh, actually, it's going to be a present value, isn't it? Because it's presently now in the bank, and I move it to a, to the future. So F1 is actually a P value times F over P. That makes sense. P cancels P, leaving me with F. Here's the factor. You got another 400. Well, you got now you have 4,200 dollars and 4,270 dollars. That's how much the first one's worth. Period. Now then, the second one is done.